Um, we are, as you said, I'm Maria Jernick. This is Michael Pravica. I teach my PhDs in English, as Richard mentioned, and I teach in the um, in the Honors College. So I teach a very interdisciplinary group. In fact, I don't teach a lot of English majors. I teach more of a variety and a lot of STEM students. Michael, as he'll talk about, is in the physics department where he does work with honors and thus has a very student body and also works very closely with um, physics majors and pre-med majors and people coming through that program. I want to mention that we are married for 20, 22, coming up on 22 next week, years. 20, this, this, next, next week, week next right, week. 22 years next yeah. week. Okay. And um, what we're going to, going to talk about today is sort of perhaps a slightly more formal version of what we've been talking about for years as we sit on our living room couches after a day of teaching. And it's something that, a conversation that's become even more compelling right now in the face of this current crisis, the many crises we're facing. And we believe that sort of nurturing the connection between science and the humanities in our classrooms can help us address some of these contemporary challenges and help our students address them both right now in the immediate um, onslaught as well as in the future as they sort of think about moving ahead. As a caveat, I want to say that we have, because of our disciplines, we're talking, we use the term science and humanities, but that doesn't mean that we're not thinking about the social sciences, about the professional majors, nursing, business, hospitality, all majors, students that we have in our own programs. Um, and so you'll see sort of we're sort of advocating for the, all of these majors to sort of come together and talk about that and it also strikes me from Richard's introduction perhaps it's interdisciplinary um, instruction as well as scholarship is a good focus for this. So we wanted to open up I'm going to pass it over to Michael talking about um, this particular moment and the crisis that we're facing. Uh, thank you uh, so um, basically uh, here we have some of the issues that we're going to be addressing uh, today uh, dealing with the crisis in science, the crisis in communicating science and, and understanding uh, science. And just the main issue is to look at the bottom. How do we train our students to be educated and compassionate leaders of tomorrow to sustain and help humanity prosper? That's sort of the underlying theme of what we're going to be addressing. Uh, so, you know, here we are today, all sorts of interesting uh, era of news. Uh, we have uh, issues of, for example, uh, medical doctors uh, trying to speak out, not being, not being heard or not being, uh, being censored. So here's a Medicine Uncensored uh, a site. On the right, we have a, uh, a, an Arkansas senator who had uh, claimed that the COVID-19 was a hoax. Now he tested positive. Uh, we have another doctor here writing an article about this controversial drug, hydroxychloroquine, uh, and, and discussing uh, that basically he's having a problem uh, being pushed to the sidelines in, in his points of view. And then, of course, we have the ever uh, fascinating but also tragic story of the masks and uh, how people, uh, you know, where some of our leaders were claiming you don't need to wear the mask and others. And then, of course, coming around and realizing that that's absolutely critical. Um, so I'm just going to just to let you know a little bit about myself. I've been an activist for over 28 years on a variety of issues, uh, including the censorship of scientists. And uh, I have on these issues, science, education, etc., about two to 300 letters, uh, op-eds and whatnot published. And I'm a full believer in the concept of resurrecting the concept of the public intellectual. So this was a letter on the right that I had published some years ago, uh, recently, 2017, uh, when the EPA, the Environmental Protection Association, had actually banned its scientists from speaking. We're here, the scientists were doing research with public money and, and uh, were banned from sharing that information, those insights uh, by the very organization that had hired them. So that uh, is always, these are always a deep concerns to me uh, as a scientist and as an educator. Uh, just some of the uh, critical problems that uh, we're gonna sort of, uh, that, we, that uh, sort of are, are what are driving this are that we live in an era dominated by science where we depend heavily on scientific discoveries for our economy via technology innovation, our national security, and of course our well-being via healthcare and medicines. Uh, yet many of our leaders are literally scientifically illiterate 
And there's also widespread problems with scientific illiteracy in the general public. Uh, and this has caused a lot of confusion amongst many members of the public uh, and also has prevented proper science-based solutions from being implemented for the myriad problems, masks, for example, uh, suitable medicines, uh, natural man-made disasters. And then of course, on top of that, business leaders uh, who often just have MBAs, but don't have uh, uh, specialized degrees like PhDs or engineering degrees, uh, they've created, they've made a number of mistakes in, in their decisions, which have ended up decimating their companies. For example, Boeing, the 737 MAX disaster and poor uh, design and the over-reliance on computer control, and as well as the disastrous BP uh, oil spill around 2010 that still, that harmed the environment to the extent it's still suffering in the Gulf. Um, as we've seen in much of the discussion in the media, often people do not believe scientists any, anymore because they say, well, you said that, you said this and that, and it disagreed. And so they, there's a deep misunderstanding of how the scientific method works in science. Um, it's okay that from time to time science is misinterpreted. Sometimes data is taken inaccurately. The point is to learn from those mistakes and then evolve and go further and, and, and resolve this, uh, these issues. Uh, so this has caused many deaths in the era of COVID. Uh, scientists, of course, are being outright censored and ignored. There's plenty of discussion in the media about that. And then, of course, the politicization and uh, dehumanization of science. Uh, these are all issues. So just one small example uh, of fighting science literacy. Here I had a letter published in The Hill in Washington, D.C. on climate change in February 2018. And uh, above my letter was a letter published by uh, Lamar Smith. And as you can see in the upper left, he has a BA in American Studies and a JD uh, from Yale, um, uh, sorry, from Yale and a JD from Southern Methodist University, but no science degree whatsoever. Not to say that he maybe didn't take a science course or two, but the point is no specific science specialization. And yet he was the chairman of the House Space and Science Technology Committee as a non-scientist speaking about an issue totally in the realm of science, climate change. So, Again, one might say this is the blind leading the blind, and this is what we're trying to fight. So scientists, from my point of view, need to learn to communicate better to be, and better educated in the human condition. We need to demystify science. We need to show we're all science. We're part of science. It's natural philosophy. We are part of nature. Uh, and scientists must also regularly inform the public that supports them and seek to guide political leaders in this process to implement logical science-based, not irrational, politically-based solutions. And then just, just to, to, again, to demonstrate the crisis here, there was a, a beautiful um, a book written, a short book by the National Academy, a uh, number of Nobel laureates and specialists called, uh, wrote it called Rising Above the Gathering Storm, Energizing and Employing America for a Brighter, brighter and Economic Future. And we can analogize the American economy and our technological process, uh, prowess as a finely tuned high performance sports car. And so the point is to keep that sports car in tip top condition, you have to regularly maintain it. You improve it, you innovate. Imagine what happens when the next generation of our students don't have that ability to innovate, don't have that ability to, to maintain and, and that fine tuned sports car. It's gonna go into disrepair very quickly. And knowledge is akin to a flame that is only sustained via education. And so that's what we're the driving philosophy here of why it's so critical to uh, support science and as well as communicate science. And one of the people who stands out is Vannevar Bush who emphasized the importance of scientific research and funding it, and uh, was the one of the founding members of the National Science Foundation and Raytheon. And this is sort of what's guiding this, uh, this criticality is that we're losing that sense of, of how important science is to our society. And then uh, just to give you a quote on the other sense, science is but a perversion of itself unless it has it's as its ultimate goal, the betterment of human, humanity. This was from Nikola Tesla, the founder of our modern alternating current system, and also considered the father of the radio, a uh, Serbian American immigrant inventor, and who transformed the world. And so the point is, that's the essence is not only do scientists need to communicate science, but we have to also think from a humanistic perspective and questions such as, you know, where is artificial intelligence going? Uh, intelligence gathering, this era of Big Brother, 
uh, plundering of our natural resources, um, you know, fracking, for example, uh, uh, you know, these exploring 30,000 feet under the lithos lithosphere uh, to get oil, climate change, uh, manipulation of DNA via GMO, and then introducing untested genetic genetically modified strains into our environment, inadequately funded and directed research, uh, which means loss of serendipity and innovation. Of course, we talked about the censorship of scientists. Many questions about 5G microwave technology, its pervasiveness and inherent possible biological dangers in the microwave spectrum. And then finally, related to this poisoning of our ecosphere. These are questions that scientists need to be asking as well uh, as humanists, as humanists, to, uh, to ask where we're going, what is the direction. Okay. I'm going to just ask, we'll get, we go back to two slides here, just to the to this point here about what scientists need, just to make a point that um, one thing I do in my function at the Honors College is that I serve on a lot of honors thesis committees and a number of them are in the sciences and I'm really there for the writing and for the structure and the editing. Uh, but one thing that we joke about, but I'm not joking, is the students work on developing their little cocktail party five minute spiel about what their research is and what its implications are. And we spend a lot of time talking about how important it is for them to be able to communicate sort of in lay people's terms what they're doing. One never knows when one will run into a, a possible donor, funder, um, and that becomes even important to be able to translate that even to other people in the sciences because we become so specialized that not necessarily if you're specialized in one area you may not understand or be as, as as sensitive or open to the implications in a specialized other field. However, part of that also is when we think about the human condition is encouraging students to understand sort of the historical um, relationship of communities, public communities with research and development and that there have been certain moments in our history where that's been very important. There have been moments in our history where it's been looked at with suspicion for them to understand how that's evolved and sometimes some of the roadblocks that they run up against are not necessarily new or um, and there are ways that we can think about why people respond the way they do and what else is happening sort of broad to make that more broad based however i do not want to just one before that i don't want to just pick on the science students at all because what i have noticed in my teaching and what is clear from the opening where Michael sort of talked about the public response, particularly now in the age of COVID, is that the general population needs to understand more about scientific methods and process, um, how that governs scientific innovation and how it's actually, many of the procedures are related to the work that we do in other disciplines. It's not so foreign. And I look at the general population and their responses and then I think about also my students as members of that, whether they're in STEM or not, or in other fields. Um, if we take a look at this meme, which I, I am not at all supporting as a peer reviewed source, right? But more if I were a literary historian, well, I am a literary cultural historian, but in a hundred years, if I came back and found this as a literary artifact, I would ask, what does this say about our culture that this circulated in social media, it's a popular form, it's a popular genre, what is this telling us? And these ideas about what science does and how science works, you know, I realized, and there are lots of reasons based on my upbringing and my community, that for me, this was I, almost an assumption. I thought people knew that. And what has become more clear in my classroom, and, you know, I've been teaching for almost 30 years, so I don't know why it's taken so long for me in some ways to really crystallize this, is that that's not understood. Um, that science is not, you know, I'm going to do an experiment and prove something right away, that it's messy, that it's serendipitous, that it is a lot of time people don't know what they're doing. We love the Einstein quote about that's why we call it research, but that really, even if it shows up on posters, it, the, uh, the implication of that isn't really there. So when I think about that and I think about the problems, how that plays out in my classroom, I've really been noticing more and more that there is a discussion, whereas maybe we could say there is a strong component, not with everyone. I mean, there's a divide, 
I was a suspicion in scientist. I would say a lot of my students are suspicious of people who are not in science or math. All that is subjective work in their opinion. And science, as they understand it, is completely objective. And we start having, and the answers are very clear. So there is not, there's a lack of understanding. And while I admire the faith in science to solve our problems, to provide us that clarity, there are problems that yeah. can come up. Um, and some of those problems I see is that when you do run into that roadblock of whether either science, your classes become hard, your research in the lab becomes hard, uh, an expert in the public, you know, medical expert, whether it be Dr. Fauci or somebody else changes their mind, will there be disillusionment in the process? The mass debate is a great example of that. Do we start losing our respect for expertise? Uh, and that's expertise in many different arenas. I'm not just talking about the humanities or science. Uh, can we come to understand, do students come to understand when they think with this sort of conviction that science is very objective and clear, that memorization and recitation are primary modes of study. And I, and I mentioned this because I've had a number of students tell me that when they finally, they're STEM majors, they finally go off to either medical school or kinesiology or PhDs in, in physical therapy, and certainly not all of them, but they, enough of them have told me that it has been such a shock to realize that they suddenly had to do that analysis and interpretation and case studies. It wasn't as clear cut as what they had thought and what they had, the skills that they had really developed. And, you know, that is sort of perhaps what they focus yeah, on. Yeah, if I could just add, you know, science is empirically based, it's data driven. But of course, it's not only data driven. The point is you garner data to the best of your ability and then you interpret the data. You form hypotheses uh, or, or from a hypothesis, you generate data to see if it, it verifies it. And, you know, we live in a universe of, nearly infinite variables. And what we as human beings are trying to do is reduce those variables and essentially use the data to understand nature a little bit better. And the point is we live also in a universe dominated by something called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So there's actually a built-in uncertainty into our universe that you just can't take out. And unfortunately, sometimes the way science is presented, it's this clear cut, you know, this has only one answer, only one solution. And in fact, what you find is that's absolutely not the case in most of science. There's many things are actively uh, debated. You know, have we formed uh, metallic hydrogen, for example? Uh, all of these are deep questions that are still being de debated and, and argued and, and, and trying to repeat the data to see how reproducible. So this is a problem that, that needs to be emphasized in, and is when I discuss science in the public, that there is always inherent uncertainty. Uh, we are not, there's no such thing as perfection in this universe. And, and so uh, at least the way we might see it. So the point is that from that, we have to understand that there's always an inherent uncertainty in science. And this is a discussion we, that we try to have with our students, or I've started having very explicitly and then drawing on the faculty, the science faculty in my lives to help with that. Um, it's not just a problem. I, in having that discussion that I've noticed, one of my students who was an organic chem minor, I believe, brought me this article that I've since then started showing in my first year writing class where we're writing about, you know, the meaning of life and other sorts of texts. So not necessarily focused exclusively on science at all. But it makes this point that in science education, we don't do enough of teaching our students how to be productively stupid. And I actually think that can also apply to all the disciplines, right? Students have extreme discomfort with feeling uncomfortable, um, which is human, very human, I understand it. And then in the next passage, just Schwartz from the journal of Gel Cell Science is making the point um, that the problem is this can be very uncomfortable bumbling along for students who are accustomed to getting the answers right later in the article. Earlier in the article, he makes the point that a lot of people who go into science originally are really good at it in high school and they're good at taking tests and learning from that. So that it feels like immediately gratifying. And then what you start to realize is that it's, it's very uncomfortable and you have to get used to feeling comfortable with feeling uncomfortable all the time. Murphy's Law often, often yeah, yeah, dominates. Re relegates it, yes. <laughs> Expect the unexpected. So, in, in a, and having both students who are, um, who are STEM 
majors and students who are not. We believe understanding the elements of science, both that it's not this completely clear cut objectivity, that there is a lot of discovery um, and create, you know, part of that also is that sometimes my science students say, hey, I'm not creative, not like the art major, but when you start to realize how much creativity is involved in all disciplines, I mean, you're in business and nursing, the creative output, exercising that, and I know, um, our business school is the innovator in discussing actually explicitly um, creativity. Uh, that becomes an important conversation to sort of shake them from the foundations. And so we, we also believe that bringing science and the humanities together in particular, that's what we can do to help students understand why that's important because we probably all heard that, I don't need that, that's not my major. I, why do I need to take these sorts of courses? And, and so that translates into the next conversation that we're gonna have. I mean, this is just another funny meme that a colleague had on his door and I liked it about why those two things go together, right? How to do it versus whether you should do it or not do it. So that's the next one. Okay, so one, one idea that we had from having students study science and having them study humanities, I mean, I think that within these categories that we've broken down, um, talking to students, and that seems like really being transparent with our students about why we ask them to do these things and why they may be taking a writing freshman writing course, because why am I doing this, I'm a this major, or why does, why does a humanities major need to take math or need to take biology or have some familiarity? Um, we can break it down and say, oh, these are things that you will get from studying these dis different disciplines. You're living in an age defined by scientific innovation. You better have some familiarity with it. You better have some numerical literacy. Critical thinking comes with that along with the humanities, certainly your writing skills. Historical context becomes very important because you know, when I think about this, our current discussions around COVID and quarantine, I think a lot about the AIDS epidemic and the outburst in the 80s. I do think about the seatbelt discussion. Uh, you know, there are so many, I think about the Spanish flu, I think about, uh, I think about the Blitz in London. You know, there are so many other historical precedents that can kind of give us a framework to look at these moments. And sharing that with the students, I mean, including the Newton and the Shakespeare, what they did, not to put any pressure on them if they have to go write these plays, but sort of how, how helping them understand that what they're facing at a moment like this um, there has, <laughs> the world is suffering and it's even suffering right now, even if it's not in, if they have not encountered it. Um, we certainly have students from a range of experiences. Some of them have incredible challenges, uh, but others have not. And so in some ways this can be very daunting. So understanding, particularly now, but in general, um, where a lot of our debates come from, developing the habit of self-reflection. And these are also all qualities in traits that are not just promoted in individual departments, but our university has a list of, you know, undergraduate learning outcomes. And it's this critical thinking, know your major, know you're prepared for a job, but also understand yourself as a global citizen, developing your ethical sense to develop your sense as a, as a good citizen, right? And that is traditionally, if we have a sense of that historical context, the American US undergraduate education was supposed to do that to promote um, your sense of responsibility to your community, appreciate expertise, understand that certain people have developed and devoted their lives, whatever the discipline or the arena um, to a certain area. Maybe we should listen to them sometimes and think critically. Um, understand that the work that we do in academia is not always different. For instance, when in our class, a discussion came up that when my students write in response to a text in a first year writing class, and we talk about ways to take a confusing text and ask lots of questions about it and write in response and see which direction interests the most and what interest student A will not be the same thing that student B notices. And then another student tells us that when she addresses a physics problem, she asks questions of it and looks at it this way or that way and decides which approach is better. And we see the common sort of common elements of intellectual inquiry. It's exciting, the light bulb goes off. So trying to encourage those, those conversations and spaces between students of different disciplines becomes really, really powerful.
And really what we're arguing for is something that Martha Nussbaum will tell us that in the United States we should be proud of, and it's our liberal arts model of education. And a lot of times people throw that around, they use liberal arts as conflated with the humanities. It's not what that means. The liberal arts is generally means either, as she says, a broad range of subjects that you're asked to take. Um, a liberal arts subject could be a subject that doesn't have a profession attached to it. So biology, chemistry, physics, these are all liberal arts subjects. However, even if you have an engineering major, you're being asked in the United States to have a liberal arts degree because of the broad claims. And according to Martha Nussbaum, whom I'm sure many of you know, um, in this book, Not for Profit, this is connected, but for many of us, for being sympathetic democratic citizens, so good citizenship. And the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2013 asked us to remember that because that kind of broad education is important for both the personal fulfillment, inventiveness, insight, as well as the career flexibility and personality. So what do we do? What do we try to do? Um, yeah, so, uh, so often in my classes, it uh, doesn't matter if it's graduate or upper undergraduate or just introductory pre-med type uh, physics, I always try and connect in current events so, uh, with the class. So for example, I had been to Europe uh, for a conference and Europe was all excited about the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, this is the largest collider in the world. Um, and in Switzerland. And so uh, I was just, I was totally blown away as a physicist by seeing that it was in the mainstream media in Europe and everybody was excited about it. They were interviewing graduate students. And so I, I talked to my students about that and I explained, you know, look at this. Uh, here's, here's an example of your charging, accelerating particles. And of course, there were a lot of people worried that the mini black hole was going to be formed and it was going to suck up everything. Uh, we're still here as far as I know, so that didn't happen. But it was, it was, it was, what was good is it kind of humanizes the physics uh, because everybody, you know, had been talking about this. They were kind of excited. It was, you know, not like a man on the moon, but similar idea. You know, people were excited. Look at this. We're going to get into the early, you know, milliseconds of the universe. And, and, um, and so anytime, you know, like the Nobel Prize in, in the uh, gravity, the graviton, I talk to my students about it because they say, look, we've been learning about photons, we've been learning about uh, particles, particles with uh, a, a spin, and here's the graviton. So anytime I can talk about uh, current events, I feel that connects the students to this esoteric or what they may think is an esoteric subject when I'm really telling them, look, you're doing physics every moment of your existence. I'm just trying to get you to be aware of it. And so that's very important to me in, in terms of uh, getting those light bulbs uh, uh, to, to turn on in the students. Uh, and then I taught a course for the Honors College uh, in 2016 entitled The Science and Politics of Climate Change. I've been very active as, as uh, on this issue of climate change. Uh, and uh, just to show you the learning outcomes here, kind of in the middle, uh, I expect uh, that they'll have some basic understanding. Uh, I'm not saying they have to be masters of calculation, but just of what the basic physics and chemistry underlying climate change. Why is water uh, greenhouse gas, for example, or CO2? Uh, you know, what is the idea of energy balance between the sun and, and the earth? And, and the ideal gas law basics, and, and then be able to understand a few estimate uh, magnitudes. And so uh, I had them do a, a back of the envelope calculation. We took the 54 gigatons of CO2 produced every year by fossil fuels. And sure enough, with the most basic calculation, we all were able to work it together. And we showed that you get about a part per million, half a part per million, added into the CO2 concentration every year. That connected uh, something they could do on a pen and paper with the real world observed data. Uh, be proficient in scientific notation. Why? Because that's our tool that allows us to span incredible, incredibly small dimensions like the Planckian dimension, 10 to the minus 34 meters, to incredibly enormous dimensions like a parsec. Okay, so order of uh, three or four uh, uh, light years. Uh, and then, of course, have a good grasp of units. What's a foot? What's a yard? What's a meter? What's a kilogram? 
That's how we connect with nature as physicists, as scientists, as creatures of the natural world, if you will. And, and, then, and then that critical importance. And then I, I uh, kind of had them become for, uh, to, to, to train how to learn how to write a letter to the editor of the local newspaper and also had them give a presentation where we kind of debated in class uh, their issues so they could be, learn to uh, debate these issues in public. And, um, and, so, uh, and, and, and so I actually, one of my lessons, I taught them how to write a letter to the editor and I uh, gave them some of my tips as an activist. I actually have about 600 published, so I do have a modicum of experience on this. And so we, we, uh, we went through a whole rigmarole of, of, of what you do. And then I actually wrote a letter for them in class. I literally online, I searched a topic on climate change, found a newspaper on Google, okay, this looks good. I explained to them my thinking process as we were, uh, as I was composing the letter in my head, uh, which is typically what I do. And, and so I said, oh, look at these, these holes. This is what th they're saying this, but I want to, but this is really what we need to say. And so then I wrote it in class, submitted it, and then I had them do that. They didn't have to formally submit it, of course, but one did, and he actually had his letter published. I gave him some extra credit. So they were excited in this process of, of uh, participation if you will, in debate, participation in our democracy. And so I gave him some inspirational things. Why do we want it? Why do we care uh, about speaking out? Why do we care about uh, communicating? And, and I think it was very well received. Okay, so in addition to that, we have a first year seminar, uh, which is a one credit introduction to you know joining college. There's a version of that across our university everyone takes one we have one specifically in in honors in the honors we use ken bain's um book what the best college students do because he does make a really explicit discussion about case studies of students who did draw on many different disciplines to, to feed their major or their focus, really making the case about how they work together. So it provides that model. We also have an Athenaeum series where we try with different years, different successes, to have faculty from different disciplines talk about the work they do and how they found them, just how they found their way to that work and sort of the kinds of questions and enthusiasms and excitements. And actually this year we were planning to do a panel of different faculty for different disciplines to introduce that. Uh, but we've had some, since everything is going, essentially everything will be virtual. We have a few challenges that we're trying to work on in that way, but that's pending. Um, in the first year writing class, and um, I'm going to let Michael say something about that, but I actually, when I really realized and kept hearing from my students, oh, subjective, subjective, everything is subjective, not like science, um, I decided it was time for me to invite him into my classroom and ha spend some time working with the students about research and what happens. And that, I'll let him say something about that, but it really makes me realize that space, just the spaces are important. It's easy. When I worked at a small liberal arts college, it was, there was a lot of mingling just between faculty and disciplines and we had a lot of chances to create that sort of interaction. Larger universities, that becomes more of a challenge. I think in where I am in an honors college, I have a mathematician down the hall, I have a poli scientist across the hall. So we do have those conversations and they inform and we are the way we teach and we bring each other into our classes. But I think about how much more exciting that would be. Um, I happen to be married to someone that I can just bother and say, please, please come to my class. Um, but I think about what would have happened in my teaching without that sort of influence. So I'll let, I'm gonna talk about my second year seminar in a moment, just for a moment, but let Michael say what he talked about in my class. No, yeah, I mean, class. yeah, I mean, just briefly, as you know, you know, as academics and scholars, the more we learn about our disciplines, the more we realize we, what we don't know. And yeah. I think that unfortunately, you know, the way some of this uh, is presented, uh, not just science, but just, you know, uh, solving problems, focus on exact answers. I think sometimes students can miss the message uh, that, in fact, it, it would be great. I wish everything would work out like the Schrodinger's equation solution for hydrogen and for one electron in hydrogen. It doesn't. And so I just basically tried to, again, emphasize that science is never finished. 
Um, we're, good. we're a long way off from a theory of everything, mark my words. Uh, you know, there's so much uh, beauty and but uncertainty. And it's yet that's it's, a, it's that uncertainty that drives the beauty that drives the, uh, you know, for example, the orbital solution of electrons. And so uh, that's inherent in our universe. And so uh, I just wanted the students to understand there are always controversies in science. Uh, issues still not resolved, paleontology, biology, virology, as we see. Uh, and so uh, that was just my goal, was just to kind of emphasize that to the students that science, even in itself, can be, you know, subjective. Uh, you know, there are personalities. Socrates is a famous, or uh, I think it was Aristotle, who had this idea that the earth was at the center of the universe. So, uh, and that messed up humanity for quite a long time. Not to knock the guy, but, uh, but the point is, uh, there can be personalities and they can drive, uh, you know, scientific funding uh, and they can drive sometimes uh, editorial decisions. And so it's not perfect. I love science. I love being a scientist, but it's not complete, like any other human field of human endeavor, it's not completely objective. It has a lot of subjectivity to it. But at the same time, emphasizing that it's not, not everything goes. There are interpretations with evidence that are better than other interpretations because of the evidence. It's not just about how you feel about something. It's about sort of what you can garner and sort of the appeal to ethos logos. Um, it's the using writing to sort of work through some of these ideas. So sort of that conversation speaks to students from, seems to speak, I wish I had started those conversations earlier, you know, and sort of realizing and, and, the, and the surprising connections. And then that leads me to our second year seminar, which is really a world thought class. It's a writing intensive class. We read a range of texts from different cultures, different time periods, it's a global, sort of global experience. So from really classic Chinese texts, we might read contemporary tw early 20th century texts from India. But in the world thought, um, I do devote a unit to specifically this connection between the divide between the humanities and science. And by the end, students say, yeah, yeah, we know, we know what you're saying. But these are just some of the texts that I've used. You know, Edward O. Wilson, the famous ant scientist from Harvard, um, how could he have written letters to a young scientist, which is very inspiring. There's a TED talk, I share that with them sometimes, without knowing Rilke's letters to a young poet, right? Different focus. And it helps my, also, my, all my students see science as this type of poetry in itself and the beauty and the enthusiasm for that. C.P. Snow talked about this divide, you know, some time ago, um, when breath becomes air, about the young neurosurgeon who died tragically before finishing this memoir had a strong education both in uh, in English and literature as well as in medical sciences and in his memoir talks quite a lot about the how those in interests intersected and how they came together to give him a broader view so these are things that by having students read about these and think about these things and asking them questions really try and put them in conversation with each other um, this is just, I want to show you just one example from a student that we both shared. He came into my class, a jazz musician from high school. He was a freshman writing, knew, um, worked on, you know, we worked on his writing. And then he went on to fall in love with mathematics and science. He works now in Michael's lab. Uh, he reads voraciously across the board, is always writing to me about what could he read next, but also is completely in love with his, his lab work and is, keeps a blog now at this link where he writes essays about sort of the big questions that his research poses. So we're pretty excited about that and it's great to see his writing skills really take off and just his intellectual enthusiasm. Like it's like the public intellectual come to life. So anyway, just to give you a few ideas of strategies that I've used or, or have been lucky to have uh, as a physicist in communicating with the public and students at large, um, I had an interesting experience a couple of years ago with Marshawn Lynch uh, from the um, uh, Oakland Raiders, and I have the moniker from him, scientist, and he... Um, this was a picture where we were, he was, I was teaching him the physics of drifting a, a race car. And uh, we also did a skydiving 
indoor skydiving together in San Jose. And then we uh, blew up a few things with liquid nitrogen. So, you know, he's obviously a very well-known celebrity and uh, our, our conversations, our YouTube, which we're on with this uh, Bleacher Report uh, called No Script on, on Facebook, and they generated millions of hits. So that was kind of a nice way that I could kind of get people thinking about science. Uh, just an example of what, what activism as a physicist can do. On the left, I, uh, I had read this article uh, from the Globe and Mail, one of Canada's national newspapers, which I couldn't believe as a graduate student. I was reading this and it said that you don't need to wear your seatbelt on a plane when the plane is uh, flying. And I, 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 so I wrote, I like literally had the letter in my head as I walked from Widener Library to my office. And I wrote it in about 10 minutes and it was published. And, um, and basically I went through and I discussed the physics of what happens if you don't wear your airplane and you're going 500 miles an hour or 800 kilometers per hour. And they uh, had published a letter thanking me for that letter after that. And again, I don't know how much impact I had, but I will say this, in the months after this letter was published, I noticed that whenever I would fly, the captain of the airplane would pilot would say, uh, we encourage you to wear your seatbelts even when we're, uh, you know, when we're uh, coasting. Uh, and, and I was very proud of being part of that. I'm very passionate about seatbelts. On the right, I had a letter published in the Chicago Daily Herald in 2011. And this was talking about uh, the sort of the physics of driving and how it, this would help people learn how to drive better via stopping distances, uh, re human reaction times, seatbelt usage. And then on the bottom right, uh, they noticed this info track, which is some national uh, radio program, noticed that letter and they actually interviewed me for 15 or so minutes on the physics of driving and, uh, and how it helps. Um, also, I've been an advocate for my university. There was a period of time where we were uh, getting knocked left and right as a public university, uh, you know, in sort of a, a very strange uh, effort of anti-intellectualism. So I wrote a number of articles uh, including uh, supporting a medical school, which now is, is been, has been established and we have our, our first couple of years of students there. And so uh, the president of my university noticed this and, and he actually asked me to be a part of a blogging committee to help uh, support the university. And, and I think this is very important for all academics uh, who are passionate about education and, and higher education. And then when I was involved in the uh, Gulf oil spill, uh, 2010, uh, I actually did some YouTube uh, presentations on the physics of, of, uh, of pressure, and, and uh, they were noticed by a columnist at the Las Vegas Review Journal, John Smith, and he wrote actually a couple of uh, columns based on my efforts to communicate the physics of high pressure and possible solutions, uh, which unfortunately did not get listened to, and what really happened is BP drilled the relief well, while everything else you heard was uh, solutions, capping, etc. It was really, they were just waiting uh, till they could relieve, so they could save the original well, and then they drilled the uh, well, uh, the the relief well to reduce the pressure. So all of these are efforts where we can, as as public uh, intellectuals, or, or trying to be communicate physics and and science and uh, in our areas of our specialty to the public at large, and um, hopefully make a positive difference. I was also interviewed by uh, Playboy of all magazines on uh, scientists running for office and. Uh, and, and, and in fact, in, in this recent, uh, this is 2018, there's actually been a number of scientists who've been running for office, and I strongly encourage that because, again, we are part of nature. Science is, is natural philosophy, and as human beings, we need to integrate science into our political thinking, into our, our machinery of, of, of governance uh, to take account for nature, uh, which we are part of, whether we like it or not. And uh, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. And I think we were going to open up the, uh, the floor for, for questions. Discuss or discussion. discussion. Did you want to read, or, let's see, you want to read some of these? Yep, I was just about to say we have uh, uh, several questions in the Q&A. Um, okay. And, and uh, if you folks can open those up and, and find ones that um, you okay. address and then I think I, I caught a few that were in the chat as well that if we have time uh, hopefully we can get to those but um, for, yeah, everyone, okay. for everyone here if you have uh, other questions coming to mind please feel free to add them to this Q&A and we'll try to uh, try to get to them. 
Okay, so let's see. Uh, all right, so it says, um, uh, okay, what can you tell the doctors who recently came out to undermine the gravity of COVID? All I can say as a scientist is don't censor the scientists. You know, the essence of science is debate. People publish papers. Sometimes those papers are wrong. Uh, sometimes they're not able to publish papers for whatever reasons. Uh, and so I think that's absolutely wrong. I think uh, there have been recent uh, panels. I think that they need to be discussed and debated and so that we can find the right solutions. Uh, there are questions about uh, problems with science not seeming clear, very true. Public questioning science in the response to COVID. Uh, and, and yes, I believe it's largely resu result of censorship. Um, let's just say that at sometimes at the highest levels, uh, when you're dealing with organizations, uh, they tend to be controlled by political figures. And then sometimes issues of, uh, of what to be said and how to say it become very complicated. And so I think that's a serious problem. I think that uh, the that absolutely we should not censor science. I don't think we should censor anyone. I think uh, the essence of our democracy is debate and unfettered debate uh, and not being afraid to speak out. And so I think that is a little bit of a crisis. And that's why we, uh, if anything, from the, my Playboy interview, I, I kind of forgot to mention that we want to encourage our students. They will become the, they will inherit this world. Uh, they will become the future leaders of tomorrow. We want them to be, they don't have to be scientists, but we want them to be educated in science. Of course, we want them to be humanists. We want them to think in Tesla's spirit that uh, not only is science for the, all of the betterment of humanity, all of our scholarship in some sense is, is asking questions. Who are we? Why are we here? How can we help our fellow human beings? These are questions that we want our students to have that instinctive sense of that's what we're trying to go for. And, uh, and so, yes, those are issues that, that are all have to be addressed. And, and I, we feel education is one of the first ways uh, to, to start with, with that respect for science, respect for human scholarship, uh, respect uh, that sometimes, yes, you can be wrong. Uh, science evolves, scholarship evolves. Ultimately, we will always come closer and closer to the truth. It's a little bit like the Zeno's paradox, but we are coming closer to the truth. We're reducing the variables. We're getting those insights, and, and that's very critical. Okay, and another, another question here asked in the Q&A. Or did you want to answer a question? Well, I would have, and I think we could both ask. Okay. And I, I'm going to type an answer to the style guide question, but mm -hmm. on the topic of being skeptical based on available evidence versus just being skeptical, non-specialists, this includes a second step of evaluating the expertise of others. How do you help students develop a sense based on evidence rather than their own cognitive bias and subject belief? Well, I'll, let me say something and then I'll pass that over to you. I mean, yeah, I, that's something we talk about a lot explicitly and it's every, and I just put it right out there. And historically I talk about, um, look what happened with the, in the West, in the rise of the 19th century with the romantic period. And we would joke around and tell them the romantics, oh, they, what, they did some good things for us, but they also had us focus on our feelings too much and what we think we feel. So if I put things, shifts in intellectual paradigms, I try to put them in a historical context and also spending a lot of time, you know, sort of thinking about, um, bringing in articles, talking about the notion of cognitive bias, about, you know, they love that, the dunning the fact that the more you know, uh, the less you know, the more you think you know. We sort of talk about those issues. But then for me, as a teaching writing, and also in the literary context, constantly stressing you need evidence, and it may be just evidence from the text. You think that this poem is this, or this novel makes this point. How can you support not only what evidence do you find in the text for this, but how do you interpret the evidence? So sometimes really stressing that comes down to, are you citing a passage and are you actually analyzing and talking about it and explaining it's not self-evident the way you read it? How do you see that as support for your evidence? And then what we do is we spend a lot of time talking about how that translates into the real world, um, into other kinds of uh, um, requests for evidence we talk about, you know, we ask students when they do research, and in fact, I just had this, this discussion with a student I taught on a class in June, 
on um, that you need to have peer-reviewed sources for balance. You know, you may have some newspapers, you may have this, but you need to have some peer-reviewed and what's the point in peer review? And I had a student, you know, argue with me about this. Well, I know I didn't put any peer review, but I don't see the point, which allowed us to have a long discussion about a lot of the misinformation and about where we go to look for evidence, understanding that some of the experts that we find will maybe one day be proven wrong. But, um, you know, what, at least this is a sort of step for trying to find the best evidence that we can at the moment. There are no guarantees. But as I tell them, coming to me for car advice, just because I have a PhD in English would be absolutely ridiculous, right? So if we start with the most ridiculous sensibility about that and sort of so the, pointing out to them how the work they actually do in a humanities class is sort of preparing them to sort of address some of those biases. Yeah, so just two uh, issues. First of all, the issue of peer review, uh, it's the same idea of why any patient, when they see a doctor, they'll say, can I get a second opinion or I'd like to get a third opinion? You know, doctors, uh, like any other scientist, again, we have too many variables. We're trying to reduce the variables. How do we reduce the variables? We get data. And so uh, you get symptoms, you, you take, compare those symptoms with a textbook or, so, or experience uh, garnered in residency. So that's peer review. Peer review is important. I mean, there are efforts, people want to revise it, modify it, but it's an important aspect that it's a, kind of a self-check, internal self-check. It's not perfect, okay? Now, there's a, a comment here, which is very good. Uh, it says, I teach scientific and technical writing in an engineering college. I try to teach these students that scientists tell stories and writing the way uh, is the way that they do that. And, and you know what, that's absolutely correct. Um, many of this, when I talk about to, to physics to my students, I give them many stories based on my own experience as a graduate student, as a professor, doing research in the field, because that again, allows them to connect to a reality of why this material is important. But I also tell my students when they say, doc, why do I have to, you know, my physics students, why do I have to, uh, uh, to take writing? And, you know, for example, just as an anecdote, when I, when I teach lab courses, I, I grade them on their grammar and, and their effectiveness of their presentation because I say every day as a physicist, I have to write emails. I have to write, you know, progress reports for grants. I have to write grant proposals, you know, and I get judged not only on the physics, I get judged on the style. I get judged on the professionality. How well do I write a book report, essentially? And so, yes, it is absolutely important for, for scientists to communicate. And, and, I, and I think in the past, there may have been these perceptions that, oh, scientists, you don't have to be good at English. You don't have to be good at writing. But in fact, actually, I disagree. I think you have to be very good at writing and very good at being persuasive uh, with your arguments. Why is the science important? Why should it be funded, for example? Um, there was also a comment uh, uh, by somebody who said we need to use teach students how to use their brains, how to have that common sense. Well, that's the beauty of physics. And many of my students will tell me because I try and break it down to a common sense kind of approach uh, in, in simplifying the ideas. Because everything starts with an idea, then everything else is sort of building on that idea of having a template of mathematics for your equations, etc. And so, uh, you know, we do need to teach our youth how to think. And that's why I often, when I do uh, class, my classes, I, I try not to use a calculator. I do things in my head. I show students how to approximate, how to use the scientific notation. So that's how we use our brains. And, and, I, and of course, even in science, sometimes uh, you have to get more than one source. So when, if there's something, you know, I t we call it healthy skepticism. We teach the idea that, you know, if somebody says that resistor has 10 ohms of resistance, and your life depends on that resistance being 10 ohms, I would recheck it just because somebody says it's 10 ohms, it might not be. And so we always try and teach that healthy skepticism. And I think that's the essence of being a scholar of an academic is you're always questioning yourself. You're always uh, doubting uh, conventional uh, knowledge, you know, not in the sense that it's necessarily wrong, but, you know, uh, wait a minute, let's just make sure everything was done correctly here. And so I think Part of the problem of this COVID crisis is that there was a rush to data, rush to present, rush to publish, obviously because of the sake of the pandemic. And so sometimes 
some things get through that maybe should have re been redone as a study or may have needed revision in terms of uh, reinvestigating their standard deviations uh, or their statistics. And so uh, that happens. And, and unfortunately, the public uh, got kind of in, enforced in this because people were dying. We were trying to, everybody's asking, when's the vaccine coming out? There, there was a sense of urgency. And so I think that unfortunately that created this uh, sort of some data that was not as refined as it could have been. And, and again, this happens anyway in science. And so uh, the problem is then people would use you know, such and such study to promote their point of view, when really, if you want to get a, a more appropriate, you need to look at many studies, you look at many papers, and then you develop what we call a scientific consensus. And that's still being uh, developed as we speak. Anything else? Um, who, how do you deal with students who question the legitimacy of some findings in science, for example, on climate change, because they've read other peer reviewed literature that contradicts the findings? Okay, so uh, let me see. So what is it? How do you, How do you deal with students and their conflicting? Yeah, okay. So, I mean, obviously, uh, I, te I teach physics. So physics is a little bit more set in far, as far as graduate level. But if you're talking about uh, questions, uh, yeah, of, of uncertainty, I, again, I explain to the students because we've often, I'm actually working on some ideas for vaccines. And so now we're getting into the virology and biology. Uh, so what we do is again, as many sources as possible. And then, and then, we, then you wanna look at how was the data analyzed? Uh, and if that's easy as a physicist, we can, we can take their data, we can screenshot it, we can look at their standard deviations. Um, sometimes some things become subjective. I mean, when you have so many variables, what was the cause of death? You know, was it uh, a thrombosis? Was it uh, uh, shutting down of the tissues from uh, hyp hypoxia? Uh, these are all questions that uh, then you begin, it becomes more subtle. And so uh, then we have to say, well, as long as you're honest, the key to being a scientist is to being honest with your data. You've got your data. If there's an interpretation, but you're not sure, you have to express that in your in your papers. You know that well. We suspect it may be due to this, but but it may not be. And so I think that's the essence of science: is candor, is being open, and then it's got to be repeatable. Okay, so you're writing a scientific paper, but the idea is that it may or may not be true. It may it's going to be proven in the time scale of the experiments of people subsequent who will look at your studies and say, was this, relevant? Was this true? Uh, maybe this needs to be improved. Science is always improving on itself. Uh, but again, that doesn't mean a reason to discount the science. It means that you need to look further into the nature of the paper in question and understand the methods that were used and therefore the inherent uncertainties associated with those methods. And I think we're actually, timing out. Okay, we're timing out. But it just strikes me that what you're saying for the person who asked about how do you deal with students who have different peer-reviewed studies that challenge each other, yeah. and this person, Andrew, who asked about how do you teach in early phases students about the, about the uncertainty because they often don't find that into the research phase. True. So that's one discussion right. that can, it seems to me that can help make that yes. point Yeah. Yes, when, yeah. When we have our laboratory courses, we get into statistics. So we teach uh, in our, even in our first year calculus-based and algebra-based physics, we will look into uncertainties. We will look at fitting, regression, linear regression. And this is kind of, kind of how you build it in. Uh, when I teach advanced lab courses, we get much more deep into it. We get into propagation of errors. Um, when I do talk to my students about that, and again, it's a little harder to answer that question fully because I'm a physicist, so I'm not dealing, my statistics are a little bit different than dealing with statistics, statistics of human patients uh, because there are too many more variables involved. I can control my variables much better when I do a physics experiment, so I can analyze that with my students and we can say, look, here you didn't measure your voltage correctly. Here uh, there was too much uh, oscillations in your magnetic field. These all factor in. When you're getting into deeper papers in, in the biosciences, you have to look at the instruments that were used, you know, the pulse oximeters, for example, MRI, whatever, PET scans. Uh, then, you know, and then again, it's not even necessarily the data it's the interpretation of the data. And, and then that takes, sometimes it's not just two papers, you need four, five, six papers before you really begin to get a better, deeper sense of really where that science is going. Does that kind of make sense?
I think we went over time. I'm sorry. No, no, it was wonderful discussion. I know there are a lot of um, a lot more questions. So I hope that uh, anyone still in the room will will uh, take uh, Michael and Maria on the chance to follow up um, and and connect after this session. You uh, should be able to access um, their course hero profiles and also can reach out to them directly. Thank you all for joining, participating. It was a, a vibrant chat, and as, as, of course, thank you, Michael and Maria. A really wonderful session. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much.